Hey guys, so we are about to start our next couple chapters of What's His Face, but today is Digital Sphere Week and it is Friday, so that means that it is Crazy Sock Day. Um, I am sporting some crazy socks that match my Cubs t-shirt. Um, I did get this shirt in Wrigley Stadium. If you don't know what that is, that is the actual stadium that the Cubs play in. But this is in honor of Kevin's birthday, so huge shout out to uh, Kevin. We had a lot of birthdays rolling around and my crazy socks match my shirt. So I have these red, white, and blue patriotic socks. One's got stripes, one's got stars. And uh, I decided that's how I'm gonna sport my crazy socks today. So hopefully you're wearing yours. Get comfy, get a snack, a drink, and uh, let's dive right into what's his face, all right? So I'm gonna move this up just a little. Um, we are going into chapters 20, and we're gonna read all the way through 22. We are so close to the end, and so I wanna keep us going so that way we can start a new book soon. All right, 20, chapter 20, The Lifesaver. The entire seventh grade is on pins and needles throughout the morning. In one split second, biking accident, a play that was well in hand and ready to go suddenly hanging by a thread. The rumors sweep through the school like a brush fire. The cast and crew can talk of nothing else. What if he has to stay in the hospital? What if he misses the play? What if his face is messed up? What if his voice is messed up? Oh, this is so messed up. What if he gets amnesia and forgets his lines? The tension hangs in the air like fog and after all the hard work for all these weeks, are they about to lose one of their stars two days before the curtain rises for Romeo and Juliet? In the seventh grade wing of Stratford Middle School, Faces are taut with nervousness, lips thin and bloodless. Classes are reduced to silent reading, and the teachers are too worried to teach. The principal has to sub for Mr. Marchese, who has gone to the emergency room to monitor the progress of his Romeo. Jolie gets permission to trek out to the dry creek bed and rescue of the BMX bikes, but when she asks Cooper to go with her, Roddy is excited. Thou must tell her, Cooper Vega. Tell her what, Cooper growls, pulling his jacket out of his locker. That the cloud that almost killed Brock lives in my phone? That thou knowest the part of Romeo, Roddy insists, and thou art ready to place the buffoon whose voice be that of a sick goat. Cooper is horrified. Is that what this is all about? You attacked Brock so I could take his part in the play, Roddy? Why would you do such an awful thing? In my world, we did not call them awful things. We called them things. Truly awful things we had aplenty. Beheadings, hangings, stretching on the rack, and the dreaded Iron Maid. But Brock is not dead, nor is he disfigured for life. He will recover, merely not in time to play Romeo. That happy task is thine for the taking. No, Cooper interrupts angrily. And afterward the ghost goes on. Fair Jolie will surely love thee. I'm overjoyed to have been able to grant thee this favor. Cooper is appalled. I don't want this favor. Sure, Brock's a jerk and a lousy actor besides, but he didn't deserve what you did to him. Nor did I deserve the plague, Roddy replies mournfully. Nor did my brilliant father deserve the execu executioner. Tis far from fair this life. Oh, no, you don't, Cooper says harshly. You can't blame this on fate. What happened to Brock was all you. If you never learned how to click yourself out of the phone, Brock wouldn't be in the emergency room having his nose tweezered out of the back of his skull, and the play would have been have a Romeo the play half a Romeo, the ghost fires back. Thee thou art superior to the buffoon in every way who knoweth this better than I. Romeo is Barnabas and Barnabas is my creation. I don't want to get apart because the guy ahead of me got taken out by the ghost henchman. Every time I close my eyes, I see Brock, his face bashed in, gushing blood all over the place. I know, comes Jolie's voice from behind him. Cooper wheels embarrassed. Oh, sorry, I guess I was kind of talking to myself. I can't help thinking that it's partly my fault, she says sadly. I should have gotten a little sore. The BMX was new and Brock wasn't that experienced. You can't blame yourself, Cooper soothes her. No, you can blame the cloud. The worst part, she goes on, is that Brock had an accident. I feel bad about it, sure, but what really worries me is that we might have lost our Romeo. She looks up at Cooper. Does that make me a terrible person? 
that is thy clue, Cooper Vega, Roddy explains in his ear. Thou must tell her thou shalt play Romeo, tis a verily slam dunk. In answer, Cooper takes out the earbud and drops it into his pocket beside the phone. You can't blame yourself, he repeats. You only have one speed, full out. If he tried to match that and he wasn't ready, that's his problem. That and ticking off the wrong ghost. They exit the school and trek out to the accident scene in the rutted path along the dry creek bed. Jolie picks up Brock's BMX bike, rolling it along the uneven ground. It's fine, she concludes. I wonder what went wrong. It was almost like the bike stopped and he kept on going. Extreme sports aren't for everybody, Cooper replies, feeling guilty. But not that guilty. For kicking Brock while he's down. With Brock's gigantic helmet threatening to slip off his head, Cooper rides along Jolie, working hard to avoid the second wipeout of the day. The BMX bike is too big for him, and the path is so rough that a ghost attack is the least of a rider's worry. He's relieved when they reach the smooth pavement of the school's driveway and secure the bike in the rack of the main entrance. It's just then Mr. Marchese drives up with Brock, and the boy lets himself out of the passenger door and feels for the curb with his foot. A huge ice pack obscures his entire face. How did it go? asked Jolie. The reply comes in a high-pitched nasal twing. That's so good. The ice pack lowers, revealing a giant bandage covering a swollen nose. Two black eyes complete the gruesome picture. I broke my nose. Jolie muffles a gasp and mumbles. It's uh, not as bad as I thought. An obvious lie. It's ten times worse than she thought. And the most horrendous part is Brock's voice. With his face swollen, he sounds like Donald Duck speaking through a 50-cent kazoo. Cooper takes out his phone to show Roddy his handiwork. Put that away, Mr. Marchese snaps irritably. This isn't something for you to post on Instagram. Even with the earbud in his pocket, Cooper can hear the ghost's distant cheering. But, he manages, the performance. A student's health is more important than any performance, the director announces tragically. I can still make it, Brock buzzes stubbornly. Oh, I'm at a fortune to rule. Donald Duck reciting Shakespeare through a 50 cent kazoo. Since Brock's parents are both at work, Chad swings over from the high school during his lunch period to give his injured brother a ride home. Veronica is in the car with him and she regards Cooper suspiciously as he helps Chad load Brock's BMX bike into the trunk. What, he demands. She folds her arm in front. Tell me what you did about this. Brock fell off his bike. What's the no? That's not everything, she persists. I can see it in your face. Look, he sidles up to her, speaking in a low voice. Just because you're a soccer star doesn't make you good at everything. He got pitched off and broke his nose. Even the helmet couldn't save him. It was an accident. It's no use. Cooper can feel the hot flash pouring into his cheeks. He's never been able to hide anything from Veronica. On the way back to class, Cooper stops in the bathroom to pop the earbud back in. Way to go, Roddy, he mutters. Veronica thinks I know something about what happened to Brock, which I do, but I can't tell her that. Not if I don't want to end up in the nut house. The time is to come to declare thyself, Roddy urges. Fear not, thou must say. Behold thy new Romeo. If you don't shut up about that, I'm taking the battery out of my phone, Cooper threatens him. But the play. The teachers will figure out what to do with the play, Cooper cuts in. Whatever they decide, that's how it's going. By the time Cooper gets back to class, word of Brock's accident has prepared to every kid. Has spread to every single kid. They all know that their silent reading has nothing to do with reading and everything to do with freeing the teachers to have an emergency meeting on the status of the play. Brock's really messed up, Jolie tells the anxious students. There's absolutely no way he can perform on Saturday. He looks like he lost the fight with a battering ram. Oh, Aiden says in a worried understanding. That must be why Mr. Marchese ate a whole pack of Tums before going to the conference room with the other teachers. Ruth is horrified. You don't think they're going to cancel the play? Nah, we'll just do it without Romeo, Tyler says sarcastically. It'll be a lot shorter. We'll have to change the name to Juliet. And it might be tough explaining why she kills herself at the end. Be serious, Jolie interrupts. The teachers will have to postpone. You know at least until Brock gets his voice back and he can take the huge bandage off his poor nose. Cooper Vega, Roddy hisses. How doth one find this conference room? Stay out of this, Roddy, Cooper mumbles under his breath. But in answer, there's a familiar click. Roddy's spectral form begins to rise from Cooper's pocket. Cooper falls out of his chair and sprawls onto the floor to distract attention from the ghost slipping under the door and disappearing into the hall. 
To his surprise, he barely gets laughed at or even noticed. The students are just too upright for more than a month. They have struggled to put together a difficult Shakespearean play. Could it really be coming apart two days before the performance? Jolie and Aiden haul Cooper up and deposit him back in the chair. Cooper barely thanks him. His mind is in conference room frantic that the teachers don't discover that they have an eavesdropper and follow him back to his home in the GX4000. Or worse, that Mr. Marchese might connect the dots between the shimmering specter in the conference room and the mysterious cloud that wiped out Brock on his bike. Calm down, Cooper struggles to soothe himself. Nobody sees Roddy because Roddy's because nobody's looking for a ghost. The only reason I see him is because I know he's there. As the minute passes, Cooper begins to sweat. For sure, Roddy is bumping up against the longest time he's ever been outside the phone. He can't get lost, can he? At the Wolfson Museum, he found his way back to a moving bus. Sooner or later, the GX4000 always draws him in. At that moment, the door is flung wide and Mr. Marchese enters the room. Stoop shoulder, pasty face, looking like he lost his last friend. People listen up. There's no easy way to say this. In a wave of shimmering air, Roddy sweeps in between the teacher's feet and leaps into Cooper's pocket. Cooper Vega, he gasps. Thou must set him right. Cooper can't take his eyes off the despondent teacher. Some of you might know that Brock had a bicycle accident this morning. The director goes on in a resigned tone. It means we've lost our Romeo. We tried to postpone the performance, but Mr. Wolfson's business interests to take to <laughs> but Mr. Wolfson's business interests take him to Asia as of next week. There's nothing we can do but cancel our play. A chorus of protests goes up in the classroom. But we worked so hard. We were just getting good. My grandparents are driving in from Toledo just to see it. We'll be the only seventh grader that never did a Shakespeare play. As the angry babble subsides into a melancholy silence, Cooper hears Roddy's voice through the earbud. Tell them, Cooper Vega, this is the, thine only chance. Do not let this opportunity be thrown out of the contents of the chamber pot. Cooper hisses back one word. No. Then I shall. Cooper hears an electric pop, the sound of the earbud being turned off. Roddy's voice comes out of the phone speaker, muffled by the pocket, but shouting at the top volume. Cooper Vega can do it. He will be Romeo. Who said that? Demands the teacher. A few voices even ask, who's Cooper Vega? Oh, great. Cooper reflects. On top of it of all, he's what's his face again. Aiden jumps to his feet. That's right. Remember the Capulet's ball? Cooper did Romeo. I bet he knows the whole part. Mr. Marchese turns urgent eyes on his second watchman. Cooper, is that true? All Cooper can manage to do is nod. We'll try you out at a rehearsal tonight. If you really do this, if you really do know this role, you'll be a lifesaver. The class breaks into applause. Cooper catches a glow glowing look from Jolie that sends his dark mood soaring. Sometimes it's not such a terrible thing to have a ghost in your phone. Chapter 21, the anti what's his face. Cooper stands in the wings at rehearsal, frozen with fear. It's one thing to practice in the privacy of your own bedroom with nobody to hear you, but the ghost of someone who lived more than 400 years ago? It's quite another to perform a lead role in a cast that's already been performing this show for weeks. You're not Romeo, he tells himself. You're second watchman. You're what's his faith? face, both in play and in real life. Worst of all, the guy he's replacing is the most popular kid in the entire seventh grade. There it is, your cue. Cooper sets, steps out on stage, his legs jelly beneath him. He opens his mouth to deliver Romeo's first line and draws a complete blank. And then a voice in his ear supplies the line for him. Is the day so young? He repeats the words, praying he can muster enough volume to get them past the footlights. To his astonishment, he hears his own voice ringing with confidence and expression. From there, the countless hours of rehearsal kick in, and he steps up to his fellow cast members delivering Romeo's complicated speeches with power and flair. When he stumbles over the occasional line, Roddy's right there in his earpiece to supply it. He's the playwright, after all, who knows Romeo and Juliet better than he does. But those stumbles become increasingly rare as Cooper grows into his character. He isn't reciting from memory any longer. He is Romeo. 
The skeptical looks from the other actors are turning into admiration, relief, even celebration. The play isn't ruined because of Brock's accident. It's going to be better than ever. Soon Jolie is on stage with him. As Juliet, she's practically glowing with approval. And as they perform their parts, speaking Shakespeare's words, Roddy's words, a lightness takes hold in Cooper's gut, expanding outward until it fills his entire body. He could fly if he chose to. It's triumph, but it's something else too. Transformation. His days as what's-his-face are over. When the run-through ends, the entire cast gives Cooper a spontaneous ovation. Mr. Marchese is practically in tears. Cooper, why didn't you tell us you were so good? I don't know if I'm good, Cooper manages to stammer. I guess I just kind of picked it up from hearing it over and over again at rehearsal. Since I only had one line, I spent a lot of time listening to everybody else's. With Cooper now playing Romeo, Tyler does double duty as second watchman in Act 5. Since his character Mercutio dies early on in the story, you're fantastic, Aiden assures him. Way better than, uh, I mean, you know, not everybody could be as good as you. What will they all want to say is that he's way better than Brock, but no one comes out with the name of the former Romeo. Sidelined or not, Brock is still a major presence at Stratford Middle School. There's sympathy for the ill timing of his injury, but mostly no one wants to get on his bad side. In spite of that, there's an unspoken agreement that not only has the play been saved, it's also been improved, and by a former what's-his-face, no less. When directors send everybody home for dinner break that day, Cooper and Jolie live the gym side by side. Even more impressive, Jolie walks her BMX bike so she and Cooper can discuss their upcoming roles as Saturday's performance. I love how you do the balcony scene, Jolie enthuses. You really get that... When Juliet asks, wherefore art thou, she doesn't mean where, she means why. Why did she have to fall for the son of her family's enemy? Cooper's torn in two. On one hand, he finally has Jolie all to himself, co-starring with her in the most romantic story in history. He's never going to be able to get keep up with her at skydiving or extreme sports, so acting together is as good as it gets. She's impressed by his performance, and not just her. Mr. Marchese and the teachers are practically gaga over how he stepped in and saved the production. The other kids practically break into applause every time he says a line better than Brock used to. If this keeps up, he'll be famous in seventh grade. The anti-what's-his-face? It's paradise. It's perfect. But he can't keep his mind off the source of all the amazing luck. The accident. That was really no accident. Roddy deliberately knocked Brock out of the play and broke the poor kid's nose in the process. If Roddy were a living person and not a ghost, he'd be guilty of assault. How can I enjoy all this good stuff knowing where it comes from? In front of Cooper's house, Jolie turns to him again. You're the best, Cooper. Our play will be, would be in ruins if it wasn't for you. See, after dinner, he can't resist adding. Parting is such sweet sorrow. She regards him with such admiration that he hates himself for loving it so much. She climbs on the BMX and pedals off. The exchange is not unnoticed by the ghost in Cooper's phone. Ah, Cooper Vega, success is sweet, is it not? My advice is thee to marry her in all haste, ere she changeth her mind. Instead of answering, Cooper enters the house, marches straight to the kitchen, pulls a roll of masking tape out of the utility drawer, and places a piece squarely over the camera lens on the GX4000. What dost thou do and why? Cooper pastes a second piece of tape over the rear-facing camera, eliciting another cry of outrage from the ghost. Cooper, Vega, thou hast blinded me! And, and, there's a click, but Roddy's shimmering form does not emerge from the phone. With both lenses blocked, the ghost is trapped inside. Roddy is deeply wounded. I understand not. Why hast thou imprisoned me thus? So you can't jump out of my phone, fly into some poor kid's face, and practically kill him like you did with Brock, Cooper hisses. Roddy's eyes are wide with bewilderment. But I did that for thee. It might have been okay in your century, but people who do that now are called criminals, and they get locked up. Cooper tries to explain, so I'm locking you inside my phone so you can't get out and do me any more favors. But Cooper Vega, I have delivered unto thee all thy heart's desires. Yeah, and every time I try to be happy about it, I see Brock with his bastion face and two black eyes. I have what my heart desires because you stole it away from Brock. Roddy's voice is shaky. Are we no longer friends? 
It's because we're friends that I have to stop you, Cooper reasons. Look, I know you're trying to help, but what you did was totally out of control. I have a personality to the other people in my century to protect them from you. But Cooper Vega. Now I'm taking the earbud out so we can both cool off. I'll get back to you after the play and we can figure out how to go on from there. On the way to after dinner rehearsal, Jolie has an idea. Let's stop by Brock's house and check in on how he's feeling. Well, Cooper hedges. We don't want to be late. We don't stay long. We'll just, Jolie promises. We just say, you know, we're thinking of him. Oh, I'm thinking of him, all right, Cooper Flex. Thanks to him, I'm at war with a ghost. Besides, Jolie adds, it'll boost the rest of the cast to know what Brock is doing okay. At the Bumgartner home, Brock's mother ushers them into the living room where her son is on the couch, propped up on so many cushions that he reminds Cooper of the princess and the pea. If anything, he looks even worse than he did when they last saw him. His black eyes have bloomed into multicolored splashes of modern art, and the tops of his cheeks have swollen into sympathy with his nose. Jolie, spying Jolie, he beams with such a gruesome sight. Then he notices Cooper. How come you brought what's his face? Hi, Brock, Cooper manages. It's good to see you're doing so well. I'm not doing well, Brock replies nasally. I'm dying. I know you're worried about what's going to happen in the play, Jolie trills, beaming at him. Well, we've got great news. Cooper's taking over Romeo. Wherefore art me, Cooper adds, repeating Brock's signature joke. Brock's face darkens, which is quite a feat, considering most of it is pretty dark already. It's plain that if he could frown, he would. Chad appears in the living room. Veronica's in tow. We're going out to dinner. Should I bring you back a sub? I can't chew, his injured kid brother laments. One pea soup coming up, Chad replies cheerily. No crackers? Come on, V. I'm starving. Feel better, Brock, Veronica says with an accusing look at Cooper. We should go too, puts in Jolie. We just wanted to say hi and let you know that your part's in good hands. The sound that comes from Brock is like an old car with a broken muffler. When the door shuts behind them, Veronica pulls her younger brother aside as Jolie walks ahead. Real classy, Cooper. Coming over here with Brock's girl to rub it in his face that you stole his part. First of all, she isn't Brock's girl, Cooper returns. She isn't anybody's girl, and I didn't steal his part. I just happened to be the only person who knows it. What am I supposed to do? Make them cancel the play? Zounds. She stares at him. Zounds? Yeah, zounds. It's a Shakespeare word. More to the point, it's a rotty word. It's the ghost language staring so seep into Cooper's everyday speech. Let's go, Cooper, Jolie calls. Rehearsals in five minutes. The two of them run towards school. Chapter 22, Silence. The quiet is hard to get used to. For weeks, Roddy's voice has been a constant companion. With the earbud, it's almost as if the ghost can speak directly into Cooper's brain. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between Roddy's words and Cooper's own thoughts. And now, silence. Of course, Roddy hasn't been silent. The earbud in Cooper's pocket worked overtime until he remembered to turn it off. The difference is that on or off, Cooper is ignoring it. He feels guilty about it. Even sad, but that's what he has to do. He's always known that the ghost presence inside the phone is a paranormal, paranormal occurrence. But until the attack on Brock, he never realized how dangerous Roddy could be. Friend or no, Roddy's a supernatural being who doesn't belong in the 21st century. The fact that he doesn't understand that he did anything wrong only underscores the danger. Cooper realizes he's just putting off the problem. Tomorrow, when the seventh graders take their final bow, at the end of Romeo and Juliet, he, still, he will still have a ghost in his phone. He'll have to figure out what to do about that. The danger of Roddy will di not disappear. For all Cooper knows, it might even get worse. Roddy's already taught himself how to pop in and out of a phone at will and to stay in the real world for longer and longer periods. Who knows what, might he, lear what he might learn next. Cooper believes with all of his heart that Roddy's not a bad person. Whatever harm he does is not truly evil, but maybe that can change too. With the earbud off and the GX4000's volume on zero, Roddy's voice has been muted. One positive benefit, Cooper doesn't have to worry about the ghost distracting him while he's trying to act, but it also means Roddy won't be there to prompt him if Cooper forgets a line. Having the playwright in himself inside your head is a powerful resource. By this time, though, Cooper's mastery of Romeo's part is 100%. He won't need Roddy's help. 
You won't need anybody's. Still, throughout the dress rehearsal on Friday, Cooper can't help checking on the ghost every now and then to make sure he's all right, if that can ever be said about someone who's been dead for 400 years. Roddy's always there. Where else would he be without masking tape trapping him inside the phone? His mouth is moving, his expression pleading. His gestures are increasingly agitated. Cooper feels terrible, but he has to stay strong, at least until the play is over. On Friday night, the final run through is a huge success. The actors deliver the lines crisply and no one stumbles over the unfamiliar Shakespearean language. At this point, they've been rehearsing so long that the words come naturally to them. The forsooths, the verilies, the me thinks these. The costumes have been altered and tweaked. Everything fits perfectly. The crew expertly rolls the large set pieces on and off the stage and the lighting changes happen easily and flawlessly. When the narrator speaks the final words, cast and crew flood the stage. Cooper and Jolie are yanked up from their funeral slabs and battered with high fives and back slaps of congratulations. For Cooper, the transformation is complete. It stretches far beyond just the play, and in the halls at school on the street in town, he gets a friendly wave and a hi, Cooper. That's never happened anywhere else. Much less in Stratford. Sixth graders treated him like a hero. Eighth graders talked to him. He belongs. Something an army brat doesn't experience very often. He's Romeo, but he's something more. He's Cooper. Mr. Marchese is all smiles. Excellent work, people. If we can replicate this performance tomorrow, we'll knock Mr. Wolfson's socks off. And obviously, he adds as an afterthought, your families, neighbors, and friends. Even on the walk home, when she's traded Juliet's gown for a Cape Canaveral Space Camp t-shirt, Jolie is still glowing. One time we went skiing in Utah, she raves, when my dad wasn't looking and went over this jump. There I was high above the mountain, catching air. I could even see my dad pointing at me and yelling. What a thrill. What was your dad yelling? Cooper asks. You're grounded, Missy, she giggles. And I was for a month, but it was totally worth it. Well, that's how I feel about this play. When I'm out there on stage, it's just as much of a rush. It's a rush for me too, Cooper tells her. It's not exactly true, but since they're never going to share the ski jump, they might as well share the acting. You're amazing, Cooper, she says emotionally. The way you stepped in and took over Romeo, our play would never be this good if... Her voice trails off. He can tell that she feels disloyal to the last Romeo, the one who would be standing in Cooper's shoes right now if Roddy hadn't taken matters into his ghostly hands. Brock would have been really great too, Cooper offers generously. Another lie, but it seems like the right thing to say. Jolie reaches out and hugs him, squeezing just a little bit longer than he expects. A whole Mississippi and a half, maybe two... He's hyper aware of the sequined star in her shirt pressed against him. You're a good person, Cooper, she says, and then she runs off towards home, leaving him standing in the front walk, grinning like he's lost his mind. Hugs. <laughs> his first impulse is to tell Roddy, which brings him back to earth with a sobering thud. Roddy should hear a lot of things. Cooper, Jolie, the last rehearsal. The ghost deserves to know about the play more than anybody. It's his play most of it. Cooper lets himself into the house. His parents are in the living room. They ask him a few questions about rehearsal, but they're more interested in the movie they're watching. Veronica's on a date with Chad, no big surprise. They're probably out buying smoothies or baby fruit food so Brock won't starve to death. Upstairs in his room, Cooper stares at the four walls. He suddenly feels as lonely as he's ever been. It makes no sense who spends more time alone than Cooper, who changes towns and schools as often as some people change their socks. He counts the number of places he lived where he's gone before making a single friend. This is different. He has friends. He might even be on the way to a girlfriend. He's at the very center of the biggest thing in the seventh grade, the annual Shakespeare play. He could complain about loneliness in those other towns, but not here. Sure, it was a rocky start in Stratford, but the transformation from what's-his-face to Romeo is complete. So what's the problem? He thinks about it a second more and the answer comes easily. In the beginning, when there was no one else, there was the ghost of Roderick Northrop. No town, no play, no friend, or even girlfriend can replace that. He pulls the GX4000 from his pocket and watches numbly as the worn piece of masking tape comes off the rear camera and flutters to the floor. Before Cooper is able to process what this might mean, he hears the click. Roddy's spectral form explodes out of the phone and circles the room at dizzying speed just below the ceiling. Roddy, Cooper breathes. 
The ghost slows just enough to glare at him before swooping low and disappearing through the crack under the door. Cooper barrels into the hall in time to see Roddy streak down the steps, darting like lightning through every room in the house. What was that? Mrs. Vega asked from the living room. Probably just the moth, her husband assures her. I'll get a magazine and teach it some manners. Heart pounding, Cooper races downstairs, and although he's not sure what he plans to do when he comes face to face with the ghost, it's not as if he can catch Roddy with a butterfly net. He might as well be chasing moonbeams. Outside the kitchen, his father hands a copy of National Geographic. If you see a giant moth, clobber it. Cooper nods dizzily. At the moment, the moth is sitting on a blade of the ceiling fan, shaking his fist at them. Cooper shoots him a pleading gesture, but Roddy's too angry to be reasonable. He streaks across the front hall and disappears through the mail slot. Cooper fights off the impulse to ride outside and chase him through the neighborhood. He'd never be able to explain that to his parents, not at 10.30 at night. He does the only sensible thing. He goes back upstairs to his room, opens the window crack a little, and sits on the edge of his bed with the phone in his hand. Sooner or later, the ghost will be drawn back into the GX4000. All Cooper has to do is wait. There's no telling how long that will take. It's gone way beyond counting Mississippis. A full 20 minutes has passed when Roddy's shimmering figure is fully wrenched in under the window sash and slammed into the phone. Almost immediately, there's another click. But Cooper is expecting it, and already has his thumb blocking the rear camera. Roddy, wait! The ghost appears on the screen, wild-eyed, disheveled, and out of breath. Release me, he demands in a frantic tone. Not till we talk this out. Thou hast betrayed my trust, Roddy accuses, after I meant thee nothing but good. I know, I know, I'm sorry. It's just, Cooper struggles to find the right words. Your sentry and mine, they don't mix. I totally get that you're only trying to help. The ghost does not reply, but he's listening. Cooper forges on. I'm going to tell you to go. I'm going to let you go out of the lens now, but you have to promise to stay with me, okay? He removes his thumb from the lens and there's no click. Roddy's still there. Cooper sighs with a relief. Thanks for trusting me. What choice have I? Roddy returns bitterly. Tis never long before this phone of thine draweth me back to my prison. That's what we have to talk about, Cooper tells him. I know it's not fair, but we're stuck together. You to the phone and me to you. Thou hast my most sincere sympathy, sarcasm drips from the ghost words. Thou livest in a world of marvels with a mother and a father who care for thee. Food dost thou taste and the cool wind bloweth through thy abundant hair. And I, there is no down, no up. I am not dead, neither do I live. Would that my brilliant father had never invented this vile device thou callest a phone. He didn't, Roddy. The telephone was invented by a guy named Alexander, Alexander Graham Bell. Roddy's stubborn. Thou hast just explained my purpose in this strange place. I must reclaim the reputation of my illustration sire from thieves like Alexander Graham Bell. Where is he that I may confront him? Cooper shakes his head. It's no good. He died a long time ago. As did I, the ghost points out. Yeah, but he isn't in anybody's phone. At least I don't think so. Listen, Roddy, you're probably going to hate me for saying this, but it's the truth. You're not here to reclaim your father's reputation, because your father doesn't have a reputation to reclaim. He didn't invent any of the things you say he did. Not the TV, school bus, not even the garden gnome. He hasn't been forgotten. Nobody knew about him in the first place. I'm sure he's a great dad, but that's all he was. To believe that you're going to get justice for him is nuts. It would just make as much sense, more really, if the person who needed justice was. When the idea forms in Cooper's mind, he's so shocked that he falls silent right in the middle of the sentence. Roddy is white-faced, tight-lipped in the small screen. Please go on, Cooper Vega. There is still my mother thou hast not yet insulted, and perhaps my grandparents, though I knew them not. Roddy, Cooper's voice, is breathless with urgency. What if you're not here to fix your dad's reputation? What if you're here to fix your own? What reputation have I, Roddy asked resentfully. I am but a poor boy, too soon an orphan, too soon a corpse. You're the true author of one of the most famous plays ever written, Cooper persists. Shakespeare ripped it off, but that doesn't change the fact that it's yours. And a fat lot I can do about that, the ghost laments. Shakespeare is as dead as I. He hath not a BMX bicycle from whence to unseat him. Forget Shakespeare, he's out of reach. 
Cooper's excitement is rising. What if the reason you're here is to claim the credit that was stolen from you? Maybe it's not a coincidence that of all the phones in the world, you ended up in mine, a kid whose school is doing Romeo and Juliet. In the very same town where your original manuscript is locked away in a secret room in the Wolf's Museum? The argument half merit, Roddy concedes, suddenly engaged. What is thy plan that I shall be credited as the author of Barnabas and Ursula? I'll talk to Mr. Wolfson, Cooper replies, when he's at school for the play. I'll tell him we know about the manuscript and demand that the show show it to the world. It'll be in your handwriting, not Shakespeare, which will prove... It will prove nothing, the ghost cuts in, because the wolf will reveal it to no one. Why should he? Thou art but a boy no older than I was in the plague bore me off, and vile Shakespeare presented my play as my own. Cooper nods glumly, glumly, so we're right back where we started from. Cooper Vega, dost thou not see, the ghost crows? We must remove Barnabas and Ursula from the museum. No man can deny its meaning when he beholdeth with his own eyes. Cooper's appalled. That's stealing! Nay, Roddy reasons, it was stolen from me. It's stolen from the world when the wolf locked it away. I cannot steal what is rightfully mine. It doesn't matter, Cooper tells him. The wolf has millions of dollars worth of stuff in the museum. No way does he leave the place open for anybody to waltz in and help themselves. Their employee, guards, probably a burglar alarm. Twas no trouble, burglar alarm. <laughs> So it's no trouble for me, Roddy points out, because you're a cloud. Besides, what good is it for you to get in there? You can't pick up a manuscript and run off with it. You need me for that. I don't fit through keyholes or under doors. A trained security guard is going to notice me standing there trying to pick the lock. No need to concern thyself with such insignificant details, the ghost explains, inspired. Thou shalt have with thee the son of the greatest scientific mind of the 16th century. With my father's gems, we shall devise a strategy that is quick and simple and foolproof. No way, Riley. You're a ghost. There's nothing solid about you that can throw you in jail. I'm the one who's going to get arrested for breaking in to Mr. Wolfson's museum. It will not happen, Roddy assures him. We are the perfect team, thou and I. Thou shalt be my hands, as I cannot grasp, and I shall be thine eyes to warn thee of any approach danger. Cooper is unconvinced. There must be some other way. Maybe I should go to the police. They could order the wolf to hand over the manuscript. Or my dad. He has all kinds of contacts in the military. Thou hast already concluded thou will not be believed, Roddy reminds him. And if I'm revealed, thou hast warned that scientists would dismantle the phone, leaving me where? This is the only way. Cooper stares as the ghost's pleading expression on the screen. This relic of bygone era honestly expects him to go out and commit grand larceny. Larceny? <laughs> oh boy, grand larceny. That's theft stealing. Unbelievable, and yet still not as half as unbelievable as the simple reality that Roddy's in the phone in the first place. How can anything be expected to make sense when that's what you're starting out with? The facts crazy as they are, whirled around Cooper's head as he struggles to put them together in some kind of logical order. Roddy, his stolen play, and the proof of it, locked away in the Wolfson Museum. If Cooper is right, if Roddy's purpose in the 21st century is to claim credit for Romeo and Juliet, how can Cooper deny him that help he needs? Cooper Vega, I beg you, the ghost pleads, by our friendship. That's what settles it for Cooper. As impossible as all this sounds, one thing makes perfect sense. The two of them are friends, and friends don't let each other down. All right, he says. What do I have to do? All right. We will find out later on what happens and how Cooper is going to get a hold of this manuscript. How is this going to change the town? Are they going to be able to do it? Is he going to be breaking and making a crime to where he gets thrown into prison? We'll find out later. Thanks, guys, for joining.